All right, I see numbers starting to go up. Welcome back to those of you who attended class at noon, to uh, everyone who's joining our virtual plant clinic today, uh, who was not at our noon class. Welcome for the first time today. Um, Today, David is going to be discussing fall lawn care, uh, and I want to get get through this uh, introduction as quick as possible so that he can dive into that. Um, for anybody who is new to this class format, uh, you can send in questions via the chat box, uh, sorry, the Q&A box. Um, I am enabling chat for you guys to ask me questions right now. If you have any technical issues, I'll be monitoring the chat for that. Um, we are recording today. Uh, the recordings usually are available on YouTube about 24 hours after the class. And as always, you're welcome to follow up with us via Facebook or email or call the store if uh, you come up with some questions that you want to have answered following. So that's it for me, David. I will let you get started. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining us as um, Sal talked about today's topic is going to be on fall lawn care. Uh, September really is the most critical month for getting our lawns in shape, looking good and set up for a, um, a, the year ahead. So I want to talk about why that is, some of the basic biology, the concepts that go behind these recommendations so you understand where that's coming from. And then we'll also go into sort of a step-by-step -step process on exactly uh, what you might need to do to get your lawn looking great. Uh, also plenty of time built in here for question and answer. So I'm going to go through, um, give me kind of a little bit of an overview, a little bit uh, talk about lawns, the situation we're in right now, uh, a little bit about weeds. We'll take some questions and then come back and uh, get in the nitty gritty. Because like I said, everybody is here because they want to know what's going on with their lawn. So to kick this off, I have a little video. It's about a four minute video, which will provide us with a um, good overview um, for today's program. Hi, I'm David Yost from Maryfield Garden Center. And with the arrival of the fall season, this is the perfect time to talk about lawns. So I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step process to get your lawn in the tip-top condition. But first, let me just give you a little bit of background. So most of us are growing cool season grasses. That means they thrive when temperatures are 50 to 75 degrees and they're getting one inch of rain or more per week of water. So that often means for us in this mid-Atlantic area, lawns look terrific in April and May and June, but then as the temperatures start to climb during the heat of summer and there's less rainfall, you'll start to see your lawn suffer a little bit. And when that happens, it starts to lose some density. You might have a few bare spots. And as we approach the fall season, it's really important that we take advantage of this opportunity to get your lawn looking really good again. Because the short days, the cooler temperatures, more rainfall, there's no time better than right now. So we custom blend both grass seed and fertilizer for our region. Our grass seed contains only the top performing varieties for the Virginia, Maryland, DC area, and we have it custom blended by a producer in Oregon to fit your specific needs. So most of us will be using the Maryfield Tough Play. This is a mix of tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass. The tall fescue is the most heat and drought tolerant of all the cool season grasses, and a little bit of bluegrass gives it density and helps to improve its wear and tear tolerance but it does need at least about four hours of sunlight. So if you're growing in a wooded environment or you have more shade, and let's say you're only getting two or three hours of sunlight, you might be more satisfied with the Maryfield Shady Mix. This is predominantly fine fescue with a little bit of bluegrass in there, and it does better competing for sun, water, and nutrients under a canopy of trees. And then we also offer the Maryfield Sunny, which is a Kentucky bluegrass blend which gives us that dark blue-green, dense, plush lawn that everybody just loves to have, but it also requires a little more of a commitment to maintenance. Specifically, we have to keep it watered during the hot, dry weather, and it does respond by giving it a little additional fertilizer. We also custom blend two different lawn fertilizers. Maryfield Select is a starter lawn food. It has phosphorus in it. 
And that phosphorus is there specifically because it enhances and aids in the germination and the establishment of new lawns. So if I'm seeding, repairing bare spots, putting a new lawn in, Merrifield Select is going to be my fertilizer of choice. Otherwise, I'll be using Merrifield Premium. This is a zero phosphate, slow release fertilizer. It's very long lasting, gives us a nice dark green, consistent color while also building a dense, healthy lawn. So we start out by identifying where we might have some thin areas, some bare spots, and I like to go through and rake these areas clean so that I can assure I get good soil seed establishment. After doing my cleanup and prep work, I will seed the entire area, and then I will fertilize with the Merrifield Select. I like to go back then onto these bare spots or thin spots and also cover that with a little thin layer of compost. This is optional, but if you do put the compost on top of it, I think that helps keep the seed in place. It helps to keep it moist, aids in the germination and the establishment, and of course that compost is also helping to build and improve the soil. It's also important that about four or six weeks later, after your grass is up and growing, we come back and fertilize it again with the Merrifield Premium so we take advantage of the fall weather to really help build that healthy root system and get it looking its very best. So that will get you started, and if you have any kind of specific questions or need any help along the way, I hope you'll stop by Maryfield Guard Center to speak with our turf specialists. We're always here to help you. Okay, so that was just sort of a, well, I'm going to say a quick overview of what we're talking about today. What I really want to do is kind of go into explaining a little bit of why we have these recommendations and where they come from. So as I'd mentioned, most of us are growing cool season turf grasses. So their happy spot is about that 50 to 75 degrees with an inch of water or more per week. So if you're up here in the Northern regions, uh, we have those conditions and these grasses just thrive and do beautifully in that environment. If we go further south down here, um, where it's the exact opposite conditions, uh, where it's hot and dry, and in that part of the world, we tend to be growing mostly warm season grasses, grasses that are better adapted to that environment. We live right in this transition zone where the northern and southern climates overlap, and this presents us with some unique challenges. And we're living through that right now as a good example of where here we are, you know, in this middle of this heat wave where we're temperatures that are, you know, running in the upper 90s and we're in extremely dry conditions. So this is a very stressful conditions for a cool season grass. It is way outside of its comfort zone right now. So a lot of our practices that we talk about are going to be very specific to this region. Because again, we can go from very cold, wet weather to very hot, dry weather. Most plant plants are adapted to one extreme or the other, but where we live, we get it uh, both coming and going. So specifically, what does that mean? This chart kind of represents, uh, it's a representation of the growth rate of your cool season grass. So grasses right now at this time of the year, what they're doing is as the days are getting shorter, this initiates a flowering response in your, in your plants. You don't think of lawns as a flowering plant, but they are flowering. And I make this analogy just like we can see it. If you go out and you look at your azaleas now, you can see azaleas are forming their flower buds, dogwoods forming their flower buds, cherries. A lot of plants initiate their flower formation now in late summer, and then they don't actually bloom until next spring. Well, that's what your lawn is doing. So my chart here, what it's trying to represent is this bright green line is to represent what is happening above ground? This is why I refer to as the shoot growth. This is what you actually see in your lawn. But this white line is what's happening below ground. Uh, the part that's happening, but we don't see it. So right now at the end of summer, 
uh, the plant starts to set this little flower bud. You don't see it in your lawn because it's literally just a little primordial bud that's only a few cells in size. But what the plant is doing is in response to that, it is building up and it is storing carbohydrates. So that's my yellow line that's there. And it's storing these carbohydrates and food reserves in the root system below ground. And it's accumulating these carbohydrates that it will use next year when it goes into its flowering mode. So this is us, like I said, above ground. Uh, you're not seeing much happen right now, uh, but as the temperatures cool off and we get some rain, you'll start to see things green up a little bit. Uh, but what is happening is below ground, the plants is beginning to accumulate and store these carbohydrates, and it's developing all that in the, in the root system. Our goal is we want to maximize the accumulation of these carbohydrates in there because this is represents, this is the stored food energy that the plant will need to sustain itself, both in just its normal growth, but also through periods of stress. So right now, when it's very hot, very dry, and the plant kind of shuts down, it's not actively growing, it will need to utilize stored carbohydrates to, to um, sustain the plant and recuperate and recover from these kind of stresses. If you have diseases, insects, wear and tear, any of these kinds of stress factors that are going to affect the plant, it's going to need these stored food reserves to sustain and recover itself. So everything that we do in terms of lawn establishment, if I'm seeding a lawn, if I'm just repairing bare spots, if I'm starting new, uh, I want to take advantage of that and get all that done now to maximize my root development so that it is better prepared to withstand when the stresses come later in the year. Uh, if we kind of follow this through, uh, we, we go through the winter time and let's fast forward next spring. In spring, you'll start to see your lawn green up, typically in about April. So this is my chart um, hitting right about April time period. And as the days are getting longer and the temperatures start warming up, it initiates or, or triggers this flowering response. So suddenly what you see is your lawn starts growing. It starts growing like a rocket. It's growing two, three inches a day sometimes it feels like. And then it peaks right here in about the middle part of May. This is the flowering stage. Now you don't always witness this because we're mowing it. We're not really growing lawns for the flowers. We're growing it for the grass, for the vegetative growth. But if you were not mowing it, you would start to see the flowers really hitting their peak in mid-May, while at the same time, all these stored carbohydrates are being depleted. So now the plant in spring has reversed this cycle and the carbohydrates that were built and stored and accumulated in the crown and the roots are now supporting this rapid shoot growth above ground and the flowering response is there. Once we hit about mid-May, that starts to taper off. And then as we hit the hot, dry summers, um, we, we just kind of, uh, everything sort of tapers off and slows down through summer. So that's what's happening to your lawn. That's what's going on in your plant which is why I keep emphasizing right now in the September, early October time period is where we really want to do our seeding, our fertilizing, our repair and restoration. So it has the fall and the winter and early spring to get roots established and get it well prepared uh, before the, hit, the growing season hits um, next April, May, and then especially into the summertime. So. What that means to you in practical terms is I'm saying like the optimum time for seeding is about September 1 to October 15. Um, so if you need to do this, and I keep emphasizing if because everybody's lawn is in different conditions. And for the most part, lawns came through this year pretty good condition. Of, believe it or not, you know, we had more rain in June and July than we have had really since that time period. So we got through the summertime. Uh, we, 
like I said, we didn't really get into the 90 degree temperatures and still we kind of hit sort of like that late July time period. During July is one of the wettest Julys we had. So we're getting rain showers about every couple of days, it seems like. And then we get August and into September and now we hit suddenly that hot, dry weather. So everything is kind of um, weather dependent. And I will say one of the questions that I'm being faced with most frequently right now is, okay, if September 1 to October 15 is my optimum window, should I be doing my work now that I'm into September? Well, my, my feeling on this, and it's not right or wrong, it's a judgment call, is right now I would be saying no, because this past week we've been seeing upper 90s and no chance of rain. Next week, as we start looking Sunday, Monday, Tuesday out, you start to see temperatures drop and a chance of rain occurring in each day. So I think conditions are going to be much better for us next week. But let me emphasize, uh, we cannot depend on 25% chance of rain. So if you do this, you are also making a commitment to water. But this, this is kind of the the if I could say the fun part of gardening, it's not an exact science. You know, you're taking the knowledge, your experience, you know, you're weighing it against um, what you see in the weather forecast and your judgment, and then you make a choice when to go for it. The other thing that I'm running into a lot is people that have weeds in your lawn where you did lose some density and things did start to thin out. You might have some weeds move in. So one thing that I should say is you cannot do your weed treatment at the same time as doing your seeding. If you want to go out and kill weeds, you can do that, but generally there's a two to four week waiting time before seeding. So you're looking at all this stuff and you're assessing your conditions. You're saying, one, you know, um, do I need to overseed? You know, two, you know, do I have weeds present of, you know, kind of laying out what your plans are and you still have time to schedule all this. So if you're looking at it and saying, well, yeah, I'm definitely want to do some overseeding, but I also want to get some weeds under control. You might make a decision to say, well, I'm going to go for the weed control treatment now. And then I'll wait that two to four weeks and start my seeding a little bit later in the year. Others might say, hey, the weeds are really not that big problem. And I think I'm ready to proceed and move on with my seeding. So really, everything just depends. And I also feel like this is a good time that I'd like to bring up. There's no perfect or right lawn that's out there. All of these decisions, every choice that you're going to make is really determined by your expectations for what you want your lawn to look like and what the lawn quality should be. In my view, the, the lawns, first and foremost, we absolutely have to prevent erosion. Erosion is just a huge environmental disaster. When soil starts washing off, all the nutrients and that it carries with it, the particulate matter, um, all that gets in and starts to foul the water. So it is important we keep this soil covered um, with vegetation. So this picture over here, is uh, Green Spring Gardens Park. It's, uh, I use this picture a lot because it is the horticultural center for the Fairfax County Park Authority and a beautiful facility and they do an amazing job of, but what they've done is they are, they just, the lawn's not a priority. It's serving as function. It's, it's keeping erosion under control. It's providing an open space for people to sit, to play, to run and everything. And so over here, their management routine is they mow it when needed. Beyond that, that's it. No water, no fertilizer, no weed control. And when you look in there, it's not the perfect uniform green color, but it's serving their needs. I look over at this lawn, um, and this is going to be where you have essentially a, a solid grass lawn without any weeds in there. You've got the nice color. You can see it's highly manicured. And I'm just saying, if that's the objective that you want, then the amount of input, the amount of effort you go into it. So this is really driven by what your expectations are for the lawn um, and how much time, money, and effort you want put into it. Uh, but if you do encounter weeds that's in there, uh, you could go through there uh, and spray with a selective weed control, something that will kill the weeds, but does not harm your grass. If you're going to do that, we need to make sure that, that during the time of application and during the drying time, 
that it is below 85 degrees. We're talking about hitting it early in the morning or late in the evening. The sprays are going to be more effective than a granule. And if you do this, then you will have a two to four week waiting time, depending on the product, where you can actually go out there and do your seeding. Um, but you actually do have an opportunity, if you wanted to, to go out there and kill those weeds before you start on any kind of seeding problems. Uh, another approach is that sometimes you want to do a weed preventer. Uh, again, for the most part, these weed preventers, you cannot do that if you're also in conjunction with the seeding because the same stuff that prevents weeds will also prevent your grass from growing. If you are in a situation where you want to do that, though, there is a way out of it. This is a specialty product, this Turf Builder, Scott's Turf Builder, the triple action built for seeding. It has a weed preventer in there and a starter fertilizer, and it can be used at the same time as seeding. Uh, so that's newer chemistry that has not been available to us until it's probably been about on the market for maybe five years. Uh, we've had been using it for years, both some of my colleagues here at work and some customers. We're seeing really good results with it. Um, it's just because it's this kind of specialty material and newer chemistry is still patented, your cost is going to go up on it. But I'm just trying to put it out there in the quick answer saying, if you need to or want to, you can both kill and prevent weeds and do seeding, but we just have to be very careful about it and make sure that we know exactly which weeds we're targeting. So the weeds that you see today are the summer weeds. Um, and for those, we would be using a post-emergent or a weed killer that's out there. The weed preventer would be things like chickweed, bittercress, dead nettle. These don't appear until next spring, but they really start growing today. So this is kind of where I'm gonna start taking questions because this is where most of my um, conversations at the garden center have been going is trying to figure out, okay, what sequence, what are my options? We're talking about what the lawn quality is, laying out options or making our plans. And then I will go into more details on exactly which products to use uh, to, to achieve your goals. So with that, any questions coming in here, Sally? Yes, we do have questions, and I'm just going to give a quick reminder to everybody. We There's a good chance we won't get to everybody's questions today, but we, excuse me, gracious, we will give you the means to follow up after the class, and you're always welcome to call the store as well. Um, okay, so we have a few people asking this. I know it's been really hot. Um, given the high heat, crunchy grass, and lack of rain in my immediate area, should I be fertilizing? Um, same question, slightly different. Would uh, is there anything extra that we should be doing given the high heat and low water that's been taking place? Well, Sally, and I'm not sure where the viewer is, but where I'm sitting, as soon as you asked that first question, it started raining. So literally like 30 <laughs> seconds ago. So I brought the rain for you all. <laughs> thank you. Exactly. Oh, who knows? I'm sure this will blow through quickly. Um, so back to it, is there anything special that you should be doing? I I think what happens is I separate these two things between heat stress and drought stress. Uh, so, so the temperature, there's not much that we can do about that. And that's part of why I'm saying, maybe I just kind of hold off on um, starting my fall lawn program. Maybe I'd hold off like another week um, just because it looks like the things will be improving. Um, as far as the moisture goes, really the, um, the thing to do is you just, if you get started on this, then you're gonna to have to make a commitment to kind of keep it watered. The other sort of understanding your question, what'll happen is when it's hot and dry, basically your cool season grass shuts down, it stops growing. Um, and if it's a well-established lawn with deep roots, it can do that. And the instant we get some rain and cooler temperatures, boom, it greens up again. And a healthy, tall fescue lawn it can go six weeks before you actually, in these conditions, before you start losing lawn. So you kind of have a choice where you could just say, accept things the way they are and your lawn's gonna brown out and you just wait till the weather improves and it will come back. Um, during that time of 
your mowing practices will change a little bit. We want to make sure the mowing is up like three, three and a half inches, preferably because the more grass we have above ground, the more roots we're going to have below ground. So as far as special care goes, um, I'm going to say you might alter your mowing practices a little bit, but that's about it. The other part, and then we'll, we'll take the next question is, if you do start watering your lawn, then continue to keep it watered. The worst thing you can do is you'll see it start to see your lawn brown out and people say it's starting to go into what they call summer dormancy. And we go water it and then it starts to green up again and then you stop watering it. And then it starts to go brown and you water it, and then it starts growing and then you stop. It's kind of like either you're going to water it and keep it growing or you're just going to kind of let it go dormant um, until the weather changes. Did I, did I get that, Sally? I was trying to think. Uh, the rain actually distracted me. I was trying to remember. Right <laughs> Finally, some rain. Um, yeah, I know it's been really hot there. Um, yes, I think that did pretty well. I think that answered the question. Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions coming in about specific weeds. So I'm going to try and jump around and hit some of the more um, broad topics uh, while you're taking questions. Um Let's see here, sedgweed pre -emer Okay, can you talk about, if you're putting down like pre-emergent weed prevention products, how long do you have to wait before you can put down your grass seed? We have a few questions about that. Yeah, so, so pre-emergent is, I would say, that's a weed preventer. You're putting that down to prevent seeds from germinating. Uh, so it's put down as a precautionary thing. Most of our weed preventers will have up to a 12 week waiting time before you can seed it. So if you if you if you're not seeding your lawn and, and I should clarify, so if you have a lawn that's in good condition, has nice density and does not require seeding, then you're home free. You could just do your weed prevention. You can do your weed killer, your fertilizing. You can proceed uh, without any concerns at all. But if you want to seed. Most of these products have about a 12 week wait time, 10 week wait time um, before you can see. The one exception to the rule, and I brought this little down again, is this is a starter fertilizer that has a weed treatment called uh, tenacity. This is one that you can do the same day as seeding. But that's like I said, that's the exception. Most of them have a, a, like a 10, 12 week wait time. Okay. Um, next question. What are your thoughts on lawn aeration? Is that something that you recommend? Uh, I'm all, I'm all on board with lawn aeration. Uh, I was talking to the customer just before the, the program here and said, if I'm going to do just the minimum, I'm going to say, Hey, I'm going to fertilize my lawn. If I want to step that up one, I might say, I'm going to fertilize it and I'm going to seed it. If I want to go above that, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to aerate it, seed it, and fertilize it. And if I'm really going for the, the highest level of lawn, I'm going to aerate it, seed it, fertilize it, and top dress it with compost. So these are all good practices. It's really just a matter of deciding um, the amount of time, money, effort that you want to put into it based on what your expectations come out of it. So yeah, if you aerate the lawn, this kind of alleviates the compaction, uh, opens up the turf canopy a bit. It's a perfect way to get the ground prepared before you do your um, your fall seeding and or fertilizing. Okay. Um, okay. I think this should be a brief one. Should we? Okay. If you uh, apply grass seed, the question is, should you fertilize after? And I know the answer is generally yes but I can't remember the product that we recommend using if you're applying grass seed, what fertilizer you should use with it. Right, so, so what happens, yes, you should be fertilizing. You can do this on the same day. These are slow release fertilizers, which means they're not gonna wash away. They're not gonna burn the grass seed. Uh, some of the older uh, fertilizers we used, uh, more agricultural based fertilizers, they were water soluble and you did run a risk of them burning uh, the young grass seed. But that's really changed. We're using these slow release products. So this Maryfield Select and this I talk a little bit in my next slide set. This has the phosphorus in it, 
this middle number, which is specifically if I'm seeding or sodding or starting a new lawn. And if I'm not doing that, I'm going to go with the Merrifield Premium, which is uh, the zero in there. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail with our next slides. Okay, great. Yes, and I see our new bags handily say seed starting lawn food. So that's handy. Um, okay, next question. Is mid-October too late to overseed and address bald patches? I'm going on vacation during prime time. No, what I, I think, um, and the, these, again, it all depends on weather, which is unrelated, but I, I have, based on my experience, if I hit it somewhere from September 1 to October 15, I'm going to get really good results. I feel pretty confident in there. That October 15 to November 15 gets a little questionable, mm -hmm. uh, just depending on how our weather goes, Of, but you know, more and more, we don't really start getting cold until December time period. So uh, I usually call November 15 or, you know, just before Thanksgiving. That's usually really, that's pushing the envelope. Much after that, it's not going to work. But if you can get back and get done before the end of October, you can have pretty good results, um, you know, most of the time. Okay. Um, I have a few questions here that are all in a similar vein, but I'm going to try and combine them. Um, so, okay, let's say you have significant bear patches, thinning spots, or you had a spot that was in bad shape and you decided you're going to cover it, kill it, and start over. So, you were talking about significant areas that need grass seed yeah. and dead grass. What do you do about that? Um, they... Well, you want to get on it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, basically, you kill the grass, you know, which means that either you're spraying it with, you know, Roundup or digging it out. Um, like if you are spraying with Roundup, that has a three-day wait time before you can start seeding. So there's like no soil residual, nothing would interfere with your plan. So after you've killed off the grass, um, you do want to invest some effort into the soil preparation, you know, cultivating it, mixing uh, some compost in there, you know, whether you use like something like McGill's compost or leaf grow, mix that in sort of two or three inches deep, get it leveled out. At that point, um, you can either seed it or sod it. The nice thing with sod is you're taking a piece of grass that's a year old, plunking it down, instant lawn, all you got to do is keep it watered. Uh, but it costs more. So if it's a larger area, then you're going to tend to go with seeding. Uh, there's a whole growing process that happens, though. When you're starting from scratch, grass seed comes up, weeds come up along with it. Uh, frequently. So you could use, again, that, that product I showed you, that starter with a weed preventer, um, or as your grass grows in, you have to let it get established, allow time for it to be mowed three times, and then come back um, and, do, and do the uh, weed treatment. So that's many times that product with the weed preventer uh, really can help us. So it can improve your success and cut down dramatically on the weeds that, that come up with it. Okay. And if you have parts of your lawn that have thinned out, but other parts of your lawn are fine, it's, would you selectively seed those thin areas or was is that an option? It is absolutely an option. And this is again, one of the ways you can sort of cut down the, the time, money and effort. I might just, if you have a, a large lawn, uh, you might just want to go up and, and like I said, kind of like I was showing that video, just kind of rake up the tatch and that dead grass in those spots and just kind of spot treat and get those areas improved uh, because otherwise it's just the, the job can just kind of become a little bit overwhelming. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I'm trying to stay away from the more product related questions. Um, we have a sod question. So this person planted sod uh, about a month ago. They watered it two times a day for the first few weeks, then one time a day. Some of the portions of sod have thinned out and died. Would you recommend to them that they dethatch those areas and then spread seed over them to fill in? That's exactly what I would do. Um, and then you can just cover that with a little thin layer of like some compost or, or topsoil. Gotcha. Uh, again, you'll get, I know it's like ridiculously hot and dry right now, but that's got to change and you'll still get good results. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. We just had, uh, uh, this is a comment, but you might have some thoughts on this. I'm not going to seed my lawn this fall since I'm not able to be around to water regularly. Um, I'm thinking of applying McGill's premium compost to the lawn and just going with that this fall. So would you, sometimes is it, do you just spread compost? That's still, is that still beneficial? 
Yes, it is. Here, here's my my thing. It's like if um, you've often heard me say, like if you fertilize your lawn, that's like putting a vitamin pill in it. Um, but it's still the same soil, the same lawn, the same everything that's there. Um, and it provides nutrients with the plant needs. But I'm such a big proponent of putting compost down because the compost is adding nutrients, but it's also changing and improving the composition of the soil. It's feeding the soil, the soil biology. It is leading to improvement in the structure. So uh, putting that compost down is always a good step. I'm always going to say yes, but it also becomes a significant step up in time, money, and effort, which is why you, you don't see it done as on a large scale as much as we wish it would. Okay. You know, um, I mean, oh, I'm going to interrupt, but real quick here, I'm going to say we, I do want to get back and I've got yes. a few slides and then we'll still have some time for questions. Okay, definitely. Yeah. So do you have a question or do I move on? No, no, no. Let's go ahead and move on. There's no way because more questions keep coming in. Sorry, guys. As always, if you have questions to follow up, I'll send out the information after I'm going to be out of town. So I'll just send out the, the different contact information. All right. Thank you. And this may get to some of your questions. So, so I was trying to talk about how we assess it, how we look at things and kind of set up a plan moving forward. Um, this is this is a tall fescue lawn. This is what most of us in this region are growing. It is a cool season grass, but it has a deep root system and it's pretty tolerant of full sun to part shade. This is pushing the limits on the shade tolerance. When I'm growing it in this level of shade, it will thin out and lose density every summer. And then I have to come back in and oversee this. So we're talking with tall fescue, kind of like the conditions that you see here or more all the way up to full sun. So it's adaptability to part shade to full sun is what makes it the most useful grass for us. If you have the kind of shade that I was saw on that previous slide, um, where you're growing under canopy of trees and there's a lot of root competition, we might be growing a fine fescue. The fine fescues, they're not as dark green, you know, they're, they're a little clumpier look, um, slower growing. So it's not quite as nice or plush of a lawn, but we use it because it does improve uh, in terms of its sustainability in these kind of conditions where it's got to compete for sun, water, and nutrients but it does need sunlight. We still need to get at least a couple of hours of sunlight into there. If we start going to really heavy shade, um, grass doesn't grow there because we're just talking about shade tolerant grasses, not shade loving grasses. So if that's the condition, you'd be much better off looking at paths, ground covers, uh, perennials and things like that that goes in there. So let's say you're going to do all this and you were you went through the process and you scratched up kind of the bare spots. Uh, you put some grass seed down the Maryfield select like we talked about. This is a custom blended um, custom blended starter fertilizer. The biggest difference or what defines this as a starter fertilizer is this middle number. This is the phosphorus. In this case, it's 18 percent phosphorus. Phosphorus, um, it's, it's actually regulated by the state because if we get excessive amounts of phosphorus in the ground or specifically it starts to get into the water, then that leads to, to contamination and issues with uh, degrading water quality. So it is um, an environmental regulation that says, hey, we're going to use the phosphate because we know it aids in the establishment of grass and having a grass is the most effective way of preventing erosion. So it's there for a reason, but only when we're seeding. Uh, otherwise, um, we're gonna take that out. So let's pretend um, this is kind of our fertilizer schedule moving forward, uh, where I have this low, medium, and high range. This is based on your expectations for lawn quality. So this doesn't mean, um, one's healthier than the other. It really comes down to what you're trying to achieve with your lawn. So if I'm just saying, hey, this is what I'm going to call just kind of um, functional turf, I might just go out there and I might even wait until October, seed it, fertilize it, um, and call that done for the year. It's not going to win you any awards in the neighborhood, but it, it will um, serve its purpose. Where we tend to encourage our customers to go 
is sort of these two steps where maybe I go in in September, do my seeding and fertilizing um, with the Mer Merrifield Select now, and then I would come back in, in October, fertilize it again. At this point in time, though, I'd be using the Merrifield Premium. If you remember the Premium, it's a zero phosphorus fertilizer, uh, has higher nitrogen in there. So that's what we'd be used for general lawn maintenance. If I'm going for the gusto and really want to um, you know, make the biggest impression, I might do my seeding and fertilizing here with the select, hit it with the premium in October, hit it again in November. Because remember back to my chart where I'm saying your root growth is taking place in September, October, November, into December. So I can pump a lot of fertilizer into the ground at this time of year. And what I'm doing is I'm building that carbohydrate reserve and I'm building a root system. And by doing that, it will sustain itself through the growth next year. So you'll notice next year, I am not fertilizing until I get to about that May 15, June 15 time period. And I have a choice where I can just skip it all together or I can just put down a little light half rate application, but we would talk about that more next spring. And this was the other fertilizer I, I was talking about, the Maryfield Premium, which you'll see here is the zero phosphorus. So again, if I am seeding my lawn, I'm gonna use the Maryfield Premium. If I am not seeding, then that's where I'm going um, with the Maryfield Premium. I might got myself mixed up. Anyway, with that, um, let's get back to our questions. Ooh, all right, let me unmute my microphone here. Um, okay, back to our questions. We had um, a couple of product questions that I'll get to. Um, this is a this is what I'll start with, and this is a weed one, but this is interesting. So, well, I think it's weeds. I don't know enough about lawns. I have creeping Charlie in my lawn. I want to keep my grass and clover. What can I do to get rid of the creeping Charlie, but not kill the clover? Your only choice there is going to be pulling it out by hand. Ooh, okay. All right. Good to know. Because what you're looking for, I use this word selectivity saying, hey, I want to kill creeping Charlie, but not clover. No can do. The same thing that attacks creeping Charlie will attack the clover. Um, okay. Just like we have things that will kill clover without killing grass, but there are no selective herbicides for what you want to do. So it's hand pulling. Gotcha. Okay. Um, do you re re recommend the iron product to treat ground ivy? I've heard it is one of the still allowed products in Montgomery County. Are you familiar with that? I am familiar with it and we okay. sell it. Um, it's an organic uh, broadleaf weed killer. So it kills weeds, kills broadleaf weeds without harming your grass, and it's organic. That's all the good news. The, the bad news is it's not as effective. So if you have persistent okay. perennial weeds, it just doesn't work as well. Um, gotcha. so, so that's a trade-off, but, but it's good because people, I understand, want to avoid the use of these pesticides, but my feeling is I think it's good, better if we work on what people's expectations for lawn are, kind of change what your view is, because unfortunately, a lot of the organic products, they, they just don't work that well. Yeah, well, that actually bridges into another question. So I'll go ahead and, and ask that. Um, what are some of the natural products that are available? Like you said, I know it's good to set expectations, but that's a question that's that's come in. So are there any others that yeah. people like to use? Yeah. So we, we've got very good, effective um, organic fertilizers, insect controls, um, disease controls. The weak link that we have is in the organic weed controls. And I talk weeds for, you know, almost all, all the time because that's the number one source of complaints in gardening is with weeds. And that's where we are most limited as far as the um, organic options go. So we have corn gluten meal as an organic uh, weed preventer of, and it also fertilizes your lawn, but I prefer to use the word weed suppression because it, it works, but it doesn't last very long. Uh, just like we're talking about the iron, the weed killer, I used it for about three years because I, I need to, I read this stuff, and but I need hands-on experience with it. And it, it works, but it just doesn't get down into the root system as well. It doesn't work on some of the plants that have smaller weeds. 
Um, so it's a it's a tool, but you have to make sure you're realistic in your expectations of it. Some gotcha. of the non-selective natural products, again, they just don't get down into the roots. So they give you quick results. They're effective to a degree, but they're not going to give you the same degree of effectiveness as some of the chemical options go. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a question. I've not thought of this before. How long do these treatments last in the bag? So how long are the products good? So this person brought, bought some products. I'm not sure what kind last year and wants to know if it'll still be good this year. Yeah. So all the things we're talking about, like fertilizers and weed controls and stuff, that will last indefinitely if you keep it dry. They tend to be just moisture activated. So uh, these different sprays and stuff, they can sit on the shelf for years and years and years um, and still be as good as the day that you got them. The only thing that's going to be perishable is grass seed. And I should point out that the grass seed has a, a sell by date on there. We can only keep grass seed on the shelf for, for one year here in Virginia. At the end of that year, it has to be retested to make sure it's meeting that minimum 85% germination rate. Seed usually holds up pretty well for about three years, but after about three years, it might be time to, to really invest in getting some new grass seed. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. We had a question coming about leaf grow. Um, can you use that as a compost? Is that like, I know, I know it's used for a lot of things. Is that what you would recommend using for a compost or is it a usable compost, but you'd recommend something else? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So leaf grow is an excellent compost. Compost basically is my generic term. It means any living organic material that has then been broken down, degraded into uh, its remnants, so to speak. So leaf growers are taking yard waste, leaves, grass clipping, branches, brush, uh, grinding it, you know, aerating it, processing it down to what is compost. So it's a very good source of organic matter. I sometimes also talk about McGill's compost. McGill's is taking composted yard waste, food waste, but also adds the biosolids to it. And those biosolids enrich it to a much higher nutrient degree. Um, degree. And so lawns perform really well with it. Uh, but it because it has the biosolids in it, some people are uncomfortable using that and it does have an odor with it. So I always have that conversation. So you make sure that you know what you're getting. But I think those two products are, are two of the best options out there um, for amending the soil, it's particularly when we're talking about lawns. If we okay. go into vegetable gardens, we might have a, a different conversation. Gotcha. Um, okay, here's a question about pH. If I have low pH soil, should I add some lime? Would you do that in the fall? Yeah, so, so a lawn wants to be somewhere between about 6.2 and 6.8. So if your pH is below 6, um, adding lime would be beneficial. You can do lime any time of year. You can do it whether you're seeding or not seeding. That doesn't change the story at all. So if you're below 6, we usually recommend about 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet, you know, of cover. Okay. okay. We've got a few more questions. So we'll just crank through these. There's a few more and then we'll, uh, I know we're starting to run over time, but if you're good, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, okay. Crabgrass. Uh, do you pull it out? Is there a product you can use or do you wait for and hope the frost kills it? Uh, that's a good question. I tend to right now, I would be saying, let's just let the cold weather kill it. The herbicides, if you go out and spray it, you're best gonna get maybe 50% control because we have these big established healthy clumps of crabgrass now. And that's going to delay your seeding by three or four weeks with most of those. So if my way of saying is if I go out and spray it, I'm going to delay my seeding by about four weeks and I'm going to get maybe 50% success if I wait you know, six, maybe eight weeks, it'll be completely dead just because of the cold. So again, you've got some choices, but mostly the freezing temperatures will take care of that. And we gotcha. get a preventive basis program. Next okay. Year. Choices to make. Um, do you recommend planting clover to fill in uh, bare areas in the lawn? Uh, I think that's totally, um, that's up to you. I mean, I think it's a good practice and we sell a lot of clover seed uh, because people are mixing it back into their lawns because the clover makes a nice ground cover, helps to fix nitrogen, provides a source of flowers for pollinators. 
Uh, so there's a lot of good things uh, to go with that. And yes, um, that's fine to include with your seed picks. Great. And I'm going to add in real quick, since ground covers have come up a few times, um, Steve Gable is going to do a class on ground covers on at 1 p.m. this Saturday at our original location the, on, in, in Maryfield on Gallows Road. Um, so if you're dealing with like deep shade or any of those kind of situations, like he'll be going through some good ground covers that you can use. So, so that's a good class uh, for you if that's an issue. Um, OK, next question. What about sedgeweed? Is that one that you would treat now? Uh, sedges, again, it, there are sedge killers. You could use a nut sedge killer. I think that has about four week wait time before seeding. The sedge also basically goes dormant during the winter time. So you just have to decide, again, do I want to tackle the sedge, wait a month and then do my um, start my restoration program? Or do I just kind of try to get a little more proactive with that next year? OK. Um, one of my favorite questions has come in, the one we always get about violets. Uh, we have lots of violets in our lawn. What should we do to reduce them and increase the grass? Everybody seems to have a love or hate relationship with violets. So, um, Well, that, the nutsedge killer that I was talking about is one of our best treatments for violets um, that does not harm your lawn. Uh, but violets are tough, just like nutsedge is very tough. Even though we have these products, uh, it usually requires repeat treatment you know, reapplication. So it's like you spray it, you wait four to six weeks for there, you spray it again. Uh, so there's nothing out in the marketplace. It's just going to hit them one and done. Like if you take a weed like dandelions, that's not really hard to control. Most of the herbicides you spray it once, boom, they're gone. But some of these things like violets and um, ground ivy and violets and the nut sedge, um, it's going to take repeat applications uh kind of a good commitment to it so again if you want to do seeding this fall maybe you wait and deal with that next year gotcha okay um last two questions um the first of the last two is does it matter when you aerate relative to seeding uh, i love to do these at the same time you know within a week of each other because when you aerate the lawn, it kind of opens up the turf canopy. If you're seeding, you get good soil seed contact. You get better results with that with that seeding. Um, and those holes, they can start to close up literally within about a week's time after you know two or three rainfalls or watering. So okay. uh, it can be done the same day or a few days later, but hopefully within a week of each other. Gotcha. All right. Um, and our final question, I have areas of my lawn with moss. Uh, do you have any remedy suggestions for that? Uh, moss is really, to me, it's an indication of soil that's compact and dense and not draining well. So this stuff that we talk about of aeration and top dressing, you know, aeration to loosen the soil, adding some compost, improve the structure, that will improve the soil making it more favorable for growing grass or other ground covers uh, without, um, you know, and discouraging the moss. Now, again, I, I have moss in my yard and I love it. And I actually try to protect it and take care of it because it's, you know, in my situation it's there. So uh, yeah, the moss killers, let me just say, you can put a moss killer on it and the moss is dead, usually within about 48 hours. But if you don't do something about the soil and the drainage, you know, within, a month or two months, the moss will come back. Okay. Um, all right. So that winds us up. We don't have any more questions. David, I'm just going to let everybody know. Um, I know I always tell you all to follow up and email me if you have any questions. I'm going to be out of town and unable to check email for the next week. Um, going on vacation. My colleague, Danny, will be able to check emails. Um, so if you email me, you'll just get a bounce back message directing you to him. And of course, I would also say just please feel free to call our plant clinics. Um, call us at the Fair Oaks store, Gainesville, Maryfield, whatever your your store is. Um, and we'd be happy to help you out during that time. Um, David, is there anything that you would like to wrap up with before we close? No, other than I'm just going to kind of follow up on your message saying, hey, we, we're here. We'll respond to you by email, you know, yeah. with these uh, things by phone. But there's really nothing better than a face-to-face -face visit because if you can come in and if you have pictures, you have samples of your lawn, we can have a dialogue back and forth. Uh, really, we want to help you achieve your goals. We don't have a set program. 
we're just, we'll talk to you, evaluate the conditions and kind of help you reach the goals that you're after. So uh, we're here seven days a week. So come in and see us. Definitely. Yeah. I, I know for lawn care, you guys have those nice books. If you still have them where you write out the um, plans. I know Kelly, our graphic designer had helped you with that a while back. Um, all oh, yeah. right. Well, Thank you so much, David. I will see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> and okay. everybody else, I'll see you when I'm back in town as well. And like I said, um, we've got a few classes this weekend. If you're attending a lawn care class, you're if you're dealing with shade, you might specifically be interested in Steve Gable's ground cover class this Sunday. So have a look at our website for that. David, thank you. Have a good thank afternoon. Sally. And hey, Sally, that rain you brought us has already stopped. So maybe, ah, maybe you can do a little more with that. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'll do my best. All right. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> Bye.